Hello, welcome to Real Gardens. As usual, we're going to be visiting some amateur gardeners at home whose progress we're following throughout the gardening season. This week, Anne-Marie Powell's back in Stockport, weaving waffle with fiancés and first-time gardeners Mike and Alison. Well, I'm going to start down here first. Carol Klein is in Felixstowe, helping plant-mad Diana Harold hack a path through her jungle. Lovely. Brilliant. And I'm braving the weather on the Norfolk coast with Brian, seeking some inspiration for her garden. This house on the edge of Stockport belongs to Mike Woodall and his fiancée, Alison Buckley. They're doing it up from top to bottom before moving in when they get married next spring. The garden needs almost as much work as the house, and when she was last here, Anne-Marie helped Alison and Mike to cut down some overgrown trees. Whatever she may have said, Anne-Marie is back and impressed with the progress that they've made since her last visit. Oh, no, it fills me with terror, this garden. <laughs> I was having nightmares last night about what you'd get me doing this time. I can see you brought the weather again. I know. It's horrible. It's always like this in yeah, Stockport. It's terrible. Yeah. You've done quite a lot down in this area, though, haven't you? It looks clearer. Yeah, we have. We've tried to clear what we can. We've got rid of all the rose bushes, all the brambles. There's still a lot to do, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. We want to start with the veg beds. That Get sounds good. Because we bought some seeds. Oh, right, okay. And we've got some manure and some topsoil. Yeah, bought so some organized. herbs. We bought some herbs as well. Organised? Yeah. yeah. So where's this going to go? Should we have a look? Yeah. Right, I think that's quite wild. That's going to be our wild area, isn't it? Yeah. Uh -huh. I think we should have them sort of about here, right in the middle. You've got sort of two curved beds coming down here. Quite big, because if you're going to do it, let's do it big yeah. time. And you can actually walk between here into a separate part of the garden just down here, can't we? What yeah. do you think? I like that. Yeah, straight. That's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. The only thing about the soil is it's very boggy and very clayy. Yeah, I've noticed it's really wet, isn't it? So mm. why don't we raise them so we have some retaining structure and actually raise the soil so it keeps them nice and dry. And yeah. it's easy to manage then as well, isn't it? Brilliant. Yeah, it's great. Do you think? Yeah, yeah. It's a great yeah. idea. So let's measure up, basically. We want to make two semicircular beds on either side of the garden with a nice wide space in the middle. Well, it's just it's seven metres exactly. Alison, do you want to put a piece of wood at 3.5 so we know where the middle is? Does it tell me where it is? Yeah, t read the tape measure, love. You're reading it. <laughs> Who are you talking to? <laughs> <laughs> Dear me. So each half circle will be two metres across and four metres along the back edge. And if we swing it round like this, that's going to be the size of the bed. It's quite big, that, isn't it? We're marking out the semicircle with hazel pegs. This area will now need to be cleared of turf and anything else that's in the way. I'm not getting that out. We've, I've hired a digger. Have you? Yeah. Well, <laughs> Marvellous. That's right, going to do the it. job, isn't it? It won't take long with that, will it? Well, if it's not going to take long, can you do that? Strip the turf. Get the stumps out, and I'm going to see if I can find some materials. Only problem is, we haven't got a driver. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know anybody? <laughs> I'm leaving yeah. them to get on with the hard graft while I skive off to go shopping. Stripping turf off clay soil is hard work, so Alison is cutting it into small pieces. You've been grafting? Oh, yes. Right, well, look what I've got. It's like a bunch of twigs to me, love it. <laughs> well, it is at the moment, but... Look, I've got these chestnut pails, and we'll get a sledgehammer to these and get them into the ground and put them in at least that far so they're nice and stable, because then what we'll do is we'll wrap these round and through, almost a bit like a basket, I suppose, and then we'll backfill it with soil, raised vegetable bed. Alison and Mike aren't convinced, but hazel rods like these have been used to make wattle fences and raised beds since gardening began. Before we can get weaving, we've got to put the chestnut posts into position. Right, that's the first post in. Let's get measuring and make sure they're all right. The spirit level helps us to get the key posts right. 
and to use the tape measure to check the radius is still true before knocking in the other posts. It's a good job I brought my sledgehammer. Stop! Stop! <laughs> Am I out? Can we get going with this now? Because otherwise we're never going to get it done, are we? Yeah. So, literally, all we'll do is just weave it like this. We're weaving the rods in alternate layers, as though we're making a basket, treading each layer well down to reduce the number of gaps. We're staggering the start and finish of each rod to make the whole thing as strong and smooth as possible. Lopping off the sticky out bits also gives a neat finish and means we won't spike ourselves as we walk past. Done, isn't it? It is. Fant honestly, it's fantastic. Fab. Good. I'm glad you like really it. Really pleased with it. But we need to fill it up now. So you know this, the turf that we took up? Yeah. We can put those on the bottom upside down. It's called reverse turf. And what that will do is it will just help water stay in this bed for a bit longer. We don't have to go mad with this. It's just so we can get a bond with the new soil. After turning over the soil and laying the turf, we're adding a layer of coarse horticultural grit for drainage. Yeah. And then it's time for the muck. I think you've got a bit of a problem with this horse manure. Why? What's the matter with it? Well, when did you get it? Um, Sunday, Sunday tea time. Well, it looks like it was probably produced Sunday lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reluctant to mix half-rotted manure with the topsoil because I'm scared it might burn the tender young plants. The solution is to add a layer of manure to the bottom of the bed. By the time any vegetable roots reach it, the manure should be sufficiently well rotted not to burn them. At last, we can add compost and topsoil, trampling it down to firm it. By the time I come back, I'm hoping that Mike and Alison will have finished planting this one and the twin bed on the other side of the garden. I'm pleased with that. Are you, Mike? Very. I love it. Imagine what this is going to look like when it's just green and lush. It's just going to be over spilling. It's going to be fantastic. I'm proud of this. It's nice. The Jacklin family moved to Norfolk from London four years ago following an unprovoked attack on Martin, which left him severely disabled. Since then, Bryony has turned their three acres of rough pasture into a garden for the whole family, planted almost entirely with stock that she's raised herself. On my last visit, we spent most of the time laying turf. The new stretch oh, of lawn was part of Bryony's plan to connect the two parts of the front garden. This has the effect of opening up the view from Martin's bedroom window. What she did was to create new gardens gradually extending the eye and by clever planting and by opening up that link there you can see further and further and it doesn't matter what time of the year it is whether it's been raining whether it's anything you, s you see something different and different every day Bryony's next project is to add more wildflowers to the borders of her driveway so she's dragging me out to the North Norfolk mudflats on a bitterly cold day to look at the coastal plants she wants to cultivate, Alexander's. Well, this is how they grow naturally, these wonderful billowy mounds of yellow flowers. So you want this running right the way down the drive? No, no, just little pockets of it. Uh-huh. I love the way that they're so luscious and robust at yeah, this time they, of year. They don't snap. They have, you know, the ability to cope with the wind, which is exactly what I need. Will they cope with your inland spot? Well, they naturally peter out just up the road, so I, I think we're in with a good chance. We can't take any of these, even though there are thousands of them. No, can you we? can't take any plant from the wild. You can grow them from seed. Right. But I have a source. One of the places where Bryony gets her plants is the garden belonging to a local vicar, John Penny, where Alexander's are to be had for the asking. I thought it was just weeds, but she tells me it's something quite special. So we got the holy blessing to I remove the them. Blessing. Well, the archdeacons anyway. Well, of course, no one in their right mind would want them, even in a, a weed patch. But in the right context, which is what I have in mind, um, they'll do just the, just the right job. You need job. a thug at that in your garden. Yeah. That's 
not too bad. There you are. Lovely. So that looks like a parsnip, doesn't it? Well, apparently it tastes like parsnip too. Yeah, doesn't smell like parsnip. Because I've eaten the stems. Like celery? Stems, yeah, they're very nice. But if you let them, the seeds develop, you can use the substitute pepper, which is what the Romans did. So there is no finer plant than an Alexander. Handsome thug. Yeah. Now I'm going to be careful. I feel I'm a bit uh... of rough in the garden, eh? <laughs> of course, the big question now is whether the Alexanders will actually survive a further two miles of mountain. Okay. So where are we going to put these? I think it's probably just along here. Yeah. If they're anything like John's garden, they're going to spread into the grass, aren't they? But I regularly cut this, so it'll be all right. They're just a slit. OK. So why are you putting them here, exactly? But the main reason is that there are all these bulbs. There are snowdrops followed by daffodils and tulips and bluebells. And the Alexander and the cow parsley and their cousins boys up as their leaves go over, so it disguises the decay. Do you think they're going to all take all these tap roots? No, I think a lot of them won't. I think the, the only thing to do is to cut some of the leaves off so that they're not under such a strain. How do you sort of beg, borrow and stone all the plants along here? Because it must be quite a lot to go right down. <laughs> do you want to rephrase that? <laughs> no, you know what I mean. You, you do grow an awful lot from seed and cuttings. And well, there were a lot of daffodils here already, and I've added to them. But people are very generous if they know you're interested. I've been given all sorts of wonderful plants, and uh, it's a good way to make friends as well. I have to say, I think probably I've never gardened and been so cold in my life. <laughs> Ever? Ever. I think that's Coke. But let's go and have a cup of tea. Oh, please, please. <laughs> Your life outside Martin and Matilda is utterly ruled by the garden. Yeah. <laughs> Where's that going? Madness, I should think. No, it's, um, I used to worry about it being a bit of an escape, but it isn't. What it does is, um, puts things into perspective in, in a wonderful way. It, um, gives you a sense of freedom. As well as the Alexanders, Brownie wants to transplant more spring wildflowers to the driveway, though this time she only has to go to the top field behind her house. These are lovely. It's a, it's a good spot, isn't it? These are dog violets. They've got sweet violets in the orchard. As much as I love them here, I just want to move little pockets of them into the drive, but we see them every day. It does seem that you do deliberately try and take natural plants or naturalised planting and incorporate them into the garden. I mean, it's oh, not I'd love to, yeah. A lot of these good woodland plants do look good together and they shouldn't be growing together. But a lot of people will say, oh, that we're going to make a wild garden. Well, that's they? far too specific. I think just mix and match and enjoy them. You know, they're in flower for a short season. Enjoy them where you can see them. So we're just going to take clumps out? Yes, in the turf. OK. In fact, they won't mind this at all, will they? No, they thrive on it, actually. And not only will, will the ones that we move be OK, but the ones that we leave behind will spread more vigorously. Now, I'm going to put them along here, on this front edge. So we've got the tall things on the back. Okay. And little starlets on the edge. Starlets of violets. They are nice, actually, aren't they? I really, really got a lot of pleasure from violets. Well, I think they're much underrated. But these will take over, and in fact, will make quite a big clump pretty quickly, won't they? Yeah, yeah, they will. And I don't have to bother with them. You know, they'll look after themselves. OK, when we've got these in, I'm going to go. But I'd like to know what we're going to do next week. Well, I think we've got off a bit lightly, actually. I mean, <laughs> Standing in the bitterest <laughs> cold uh, I've ever known. Apart from the weather, you've got off lightly, so I think we need to do something physical. Like? <laughs> We're going to mark out a new bit of the garden uh, from scratch uh -huh. and uh, do a bit of digging. And what's, what's the theme of that bit of the garden? It's going to be called the roundel. So I like a bit of humour in a garden. Well, that's, that certainly made me roar with laughter when you said that. <laughs>
After the break, Carol Klein is hunting down the wildlife and making tracks in Diana's overgrown trouble. Welcome back. Well, thank goodness it's got a bit warmer. Of course, at this time of year, when the weather does warm up, everything shoots at a rate of knot. And now is the time to make some basal cuttings. Got some delphiniums here. And if you take a cutting about four inches tall, using a bit of the stock at the bottom, you just strip off the lower leaves, leaving just enough to sustain and feed what roots there are, but not so much that it's going to lose all its moisture. And you want to get it in some soil that is at least 50-50 grit or perlite or anything that gives a nice easy root run and sharp drainage because if it sits in water it'll rot and die. If you're just doing a few on a windowsill get a polythene bag and put it over the top and that will track the respiration. You just water it lightly first, put the bag over it and put a couple of sticks in because that stops the polythene touching the leaves where it can rot off. And then when it's growing nice and strongly repot it into more nutritious compost. Now, somebody who's a plantaholic would know all about that sort of thing is Diana Harold, and Carol Klein has gone to see her in her garden in Suffolk. Diana moved into her bungalow five years ago, and since she retired from teaching, she's been able to spend much more time in her garden. She's an avid plant collector with a permanent surplus of plants in pots, which desperately need a home. Her wild area at the back of the garden still needs some clearing, whilst her vegetable garden, by contrast, is somewhat thin on the ground. On her last visit, to make a start, Carol helped Diana sow some cabbage seeds. Since then, Diana's been sowing every vegetable she can lay her hands on. Now every available windowsill is packed with plants. God, you've got modules everywhere. Modules indeed. Brilliant. And how about our cabbages? Yes, our cabbages were a complete failure, I'm afraid. <laughs> a bit of a sorry sorry. Yes. What happened to them? Well, I did go up to Leeds for a few days just to see my new granddaughter, and I think they might have just dried out there. Yeah. They need attention every day, but it's a good excuse, isn't it? <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Three carrots look great. So did those little round ones? Yes, they're patio carrots. Patio <laughs> carrots? <laughs> You've got no room for them on your patio. There's too many plants down. Here. Yes, but I have planted oh, yes. seven plants since you were last here. Oh, well done. But Brilliant. I've acquired ten. Oh, that's not good <laughs> at all. That's absolutely hopeless. I know. <laughs> I've saved something to show you, actually. I'm a bit worried about uh, a beetle that I've found indoors. Oh, oh. Look, I've put it in a jar. Oh, without doubt, it's a vine weevil. Yes, the adult, the beetle itself. And uh, where was it? It was very close to this beautiful plant. And look what's happened. Oh, yeah, I mean, that, that's a, a sort of archetypal sign of vine weevil damage. You know, these great big pieces chewed out the side of the leaf. And I bet they were going to kill it. While the adult vine weevils munch away at the leaves of the plants, the greatest threat comes from their larvae, which live under the soil, attacking the roots. Yes. Look at this. Oh, look. Oh, it's hardly got any root at all. And, oh, look at the stem. It's really just, it's eaten all this and it's chewed all this off. That's why you find often that plants just sort of keel over. But the thing is that that little beetle, were it not in there, would travel all over and into these pots, laying eggs willy-nilly as it goes. And when, when plants are in pots, they're very, very susceptible to damage. So, the moral of the story is, get your plants in the ground. I know, I desperately do want to, but yeah. today, I want to make this path in the woodland. All right. Please. Well, I suppose it is very pleasant. Diana's woodland area is a bit of a wilderness, but when her grandchildren come to visit, they love to play here. So it really needs a bit of taming before the next time they come. Wonderful. Yes. But tell me, why is it such an imperative to do this path today? Well, the bluebells are just about to come into flower and the children love to go through there and look at them. Yeah, I'll bet. Unfortunately, they go in there, they get stuck in there, they wail and we have to keep going in to get them out. What are you going to make this path with then? Well, I've bought some bark and yeah. I thought it would look very good down here. Yeah, be ideal. So I suppose the first thing to do is mark it out. Yeah, jolly good. 
we're going to use a long length of hose to mark out our route. To keep the path clear, we'll have to be ruthless with any plants that get in the way. I want to get rid of this right through the iris. You don't like that plant, do you? It grows everywhere, it's like a weed. This tree stump's coming out eventually, but not at the moment. And this is a much more solid obstacle, isn't it? And I've been dying to <laughs> I know you cut have. it back to nothing at all. Diana insists on keeping most of this orchiba, but we're yeah. taking a good well, chunk out, leaving our way clear to lay the next section of path. Here, Through here. Is this hose going to be long enough? Yes, I think <laughs> so. <laughs> we're taking care to rescue the more precious treasures, like this flomis, to replant elsewhere. This grisolina, which thrives in mild coastal conditions, won't suffer from a bit of cutting back. Lovely. Brilliant. We've worked our way out of the shrubbery to make the path join up with the lawn. Now it's back to the start to dig a trench for the path. And how deep are we going to dig? Well, I think it only needs to be about three inches, you know? Yeah. About 10 centimetres, something like that. Yeah. By well, using this cane as our guide, we can keep the path to a constant width. We could use a plastic liner to keep the weeds down, but on an informal path like this, it's not really appropriate. This looks like good stuff. Is it going to look all right? That's what I want to know. Oh, I think it's lovely. Don't you? Quite chunky, actually, isn't it? Oh, yeah. The crushed bark will make a soft, child-friendly surface. To finish the path off, we're putting in rounds of timber at either end for the children to use as stepping stones. And they're for little feet, so we little don't want... Little feet, so not too far apart. What do you think? Do you want one in there? Yes, I'm going to have someone going up to the tree. Because so the, the kids can jump the, in and... The children climb up there. Right. So. Well, uh, we've got to just dig some holes then and sink them in because you want them level, don't Absolutely you? Absolutely level. You just sort of use them for a pattern first. Yes. These sections of elm have come from Diana's son, who's a qualified tree surgeon, but you could get them from a sawmill. The holes are deep enough to make the roundels flush with the ground. Once the roundels are in, the new path makes Diana's woodland garden a delight to explore. Right. I think it's time we gave this woodland path a little test run. It's very bouncy, isn't it? Oh, it is. It's good, though, isn't it? Yes. And doesn't hey? it smell lovely? Fit for any explorer, isn't it? Just what I wanted. Yeah, and these roundels really finish it off, don't they? They're lovely. What do you think the kids are going to think of it? Well, we shall find out next time because uh, they're coming to stay. So oh, great. we shall have at least three of them running around. Brilliant. Be nice. And what we're going to do next time? Apart from play with the kids. <laughs> I think the vegetable garden. Next week, Anne-Marie is going to help Lisa to convert her scruffy old shed into a children's playhouse. Ooh. Carol is sploshing about in mud with Adrian and Debbie. And I'm back with Brian, helping her with her roundel garden. See you then. Bye-bye.